Welcome to the Cannon Beach Library's Northwest Author Speaker Series. My name is Phyllis Byrne, and I am a library volunteer. The Library's Northwest Author Series presents about eight author talks a year. Thanks to Zoom and Facebook Live, we have been able to persevere despite COVID, but we hope to go back to in-person talks as soon as we can. Our next presentation will be Saturday, February 5th, with Stephen Holgate, the author of the international thrillers, uh, Madagascar, Sri Lanka, and most recently, To Live and Die in the Floating World. Today's presentation will be recorded and posted to the library's website and Facebook page for later viewing. We welcome questions for our speaker. Just use the chat function to send us your question. Before I introduce our speaker, I want to take a moment to thank the folks at Land's End at Cannon Beach for providing her with lodging while she is visiting, visiting us here. Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Tina Ontiveros. Tina teaches writing and literature at Columbia Gorge Community College. For many years, she was a book buyer for Clint's, Oregon's oldest bookseller, and is the past president of the Pacific Northwest Booksellers Association. The first in her family to go to college Tina took courses at a community college before earning a Bachelor of Arts in Literature from Merrillhurst University. And then she went on to get an MFA in nonfiction writing from Goddard College. In 2019, her essay, The Life We Pay For, was the top 10 most read essays in Oregon Humanities Magazine. That essay is an impassioned and loving description of her sister, Missy, who has been unable to escape the poverty of her childhood. In that essay, Tina notes that stories help us imagine ourselves into one another's lives, and she resolves to be brave and create such stories, and she has certainly done so. The result is Rough House, a memoir of her often difficult and violent, but also sometimes joy-filled childhood. Rough House was named the October 2020 Indie Next Great Read was on the Pacific Northwest Booksellers Association bestsellers list for 20 weeks and won a 2021 Pacific Northwest Book Award. So I really want to want to welcome welcome Tina. I'm so glad that you could join us here today. Thank you, Phyllis. I'm um, I'm in this beautiful hotel room. Thank you, Lands End, and I um, have my computer stacked on three books and a puzzle. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forgive the wobbling, but I'm oh. really happy to be here. And it was really, I, I think I shared with you yesterday that I, I love the Oregon coast. I grew up all, all across the Pacific Northwest, but I don't usually think of it as sunny. And we were delighted to get the sunshine. We really needed it. We haven't had a lot of sun in our neck of the woods the last couple of weeks. So we haven't either. So we're really, really glad to have it. If you brought it here, thank you. <laughs> Well, let's get started. I guess I would like to start by asking you to, to talk a little bit about why you decided to write Rough House. Okay. You know, it's, I, I have about a million answers to that question. I think there are probably like three or four top main, main reasons. One is that um, I, the first version of the book was written as my MFA thesis. So to get an MFA, you got to write a book. <laughs> And I had always thought it would be interesting to study creative nonfiction because um, I like the idea of using the tools of fiction and poetry, but trying to still kind of create this thing we call truth. And so to me, it seemed like a particular challenge to, to use the tools of fiction and poetry, but also still have to tell the truth. When you think about it, that's, that, that just seems like such a huge challenge to me because when you're writing a fiction, piece or you're writing poetry, you can say whatever you want, you can make up anything and it's fine. Um, so to me, the idea that I would take, for example, the, the skill of like character building and apply it to people I actually know to real people, you know, because when you're learning to write fiction, you know, the, the sort of big golden rule is like you, you it has to be character driven and you have to um, be able to see, make, make full round characters, which requires that you imagine their their motivation and you have empathy for them. And I thought, well, what a revolutionary idea to, to try to do that for people who are in your life, people who you love, but who've also hurt you. I mean, often 
the people we're close with are the people we have the hardest time seeing clearly. And so I just thought it would be an interesting challenge. So that was one big reason is that I was, I needed to write a book to get my MFA. I decided I wanted to tackle creative nonfiction. I always knew my dad would make a really great character. Uh, also, I'm not going to lie, he's dead. <laughs> and it's a lot easier to write about, you know, especially if you're dipping your toe in nonfiction, uh, somebody who you, you can't hurt. <laughs> Um, so, so there's that. I also, you mentioned in your lovely introduction, thank you for that. And thank you for reading that essay. Um, I'm, I, I love that piece. Um, and my sister loves it and she's very proud of it. So, um, thank you for, for, for drawing attention to that. Um, my sister has two children and the eldest will be graduating from high school this year. But when I, when I was getting ready to write my book, that niece was 11. And she, I just had begun to really observe how she was carrying the shame of poverty on her shoulders in a, in a very similar way um, to me when I was her age. My sister has always been just this really, um, when, when we were kids, she didn't, she didn't, she wasn't ashamed of our poverty. She was just this happy outgoing person, but I was always very ashamed. And I noticed that my niece was that way. She's really into trying, she was, she'll kill me if she, if she thinks I'm saying she's that way now. She was always wearing, you know, name brand sweatshirts, trying to, she, all she wanted for Christmas was the sweatshirt with the latest logo on it or whatever. I was the same way when I was her age. And so it really, I, I remember having a moment where I drove her to school for her mom and watched her walk into school. And she was just that morning, she had like gotten her baby sister out of bed, got her dressed, fed her, had her in the high chair, was finishing up her own homework as she got ready to go when I came to get her. And I, and I just recognized that she was walking into school that morning, carrying so much with her. And um, I, it just struck me that she needs to see her people in books and she needs to see you know, I, I tell her in the back of my book in the acknowledgements, you're walking through the woods right now. Like you're in the hard part of your story, but someday you're going to draw pride and, and a little bit of like uh, glory from that. Like you're learning things that nobody else, you couldn't learn any other way. And I think that maybe telling stories about families who don't win the, the capitalist game, <laughs> Um, and remembering the joy and the pride and the poetry is a really important part of changing the way we look at people who live below the poverty line. Um, because right now it's pretty skewed the way we, we approach people who, who don't manage to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. So, so my niece was definitely, I just felt like she needed to see her family in a story that she could feel proud of. Okay. Well, uh, I'm kind of interested in, in this whole issue of you know, memoirs and memory, you know, I mean, that's what a memoir is, you know, it relies on memory. And, and in the book, you know, you talk about how memory is sort of, memory of your child is almost, it's almost uh, fluid sort of, you know, you can't, you're not really sure when something happened exactly, where it happened exactly, and so forth. And you, you talk about the sort of intrinsic memory, the sort of fusion of stories that you've heard and the physical immersion in your family atmosphere, sort of like the the stories you get through kind of osmosis. So I'm kind of interested, how did you decide what memories to include and how accurate do you think those memories are? Yeah, good question. You know, the book was, I, I cut as many pages as are in the finished book. So mm -hmm. there were a lot more memories in there. Definitely had to, I'm a, I'm a very dogged reviser. I, I really, almost sometimes too extreme probably, but I really, um, once I had all these pages, it was like, now it's time to step back and look at it as a made thing. It's not my life. It's going to be a made thing that I'm sharing with other people, a work of art, hopefully, you know, not just memory. And so you have to make difficult choices for the aesthetic of the book. And um, so, so some of the stories that were cut were, were most of the stories that were cut were purely for that reason. Like what is this serving the narrative? And if it's not, does it need to go? Um, but yeah, you know, the reason I wrote that section you're referring to, which is sort of about how um, our memory is soaked into us, right? Even though we can't quite define it. And I think in that, in that section, the analogy is it's sort of like how a salmon knows its way back to the river where it was born, just because it's like, it has absorbed minerals from the entire path, right? And so it sort of has this, this way of knowing where it comes from 
that can't really be defined or um, we still haven't quite figured it out. And so I felt like it's really, really important. I studied a lot of memoir when I was writing the book and I felt like it's very important to be upfront with your reader um, at the very start about the truth in memory because nobody can remember anything perfectly. It's just not possible unless you were, you know, it may be a travel memoir where you took meticulous notes the whole time, but it's just not possible. And so I felt like it was important to say right up front, hey, I'm doing my best. And um, this is this is how I remember it. I did ask, you know, the two people who survived most of these stories with me, that's my mom and my brother, to read, to read the first draft once it was finished. Um, first to tell me if I got anything wrong. And then they had complete um, veto power over anything before I would even consider letting a publisher look at it or um, letting it go to print. So to me, it wasn't worth causing anybody undue pain. You know, if mm -hmm. I'm going to be a writer, I need to be able to revise and, and that's a skill I need to have. So I just felt like it wasn't worth it to me to, to hurt anyone. So, so it was nice to have their uh, reassurance. And my brother said it best. He said there were parts, there were little parts where I remember it differently but the way you remembered it feels true because it feels like the way you saw the world. And so he was acknowledging that he and I have very different personalities and different ways that we perceive things. Um, but he couldn't, you know, he just let me know if there was anything factually untrue and same with my mom. Um, because yeah, and I, tr and I use the phrase, I imagine a lot in the book <laughs> mm -hmm. or, you know, or I will say, my memory's imperfect here, just because I, I do feel like, you know, Mary Carr has a really great book on writing memoir called The Art of Memoir. And she kind of says in there, like, you, you need to, you owe your reader the truth. And she, she compares it, excuse my language, this is Mary Carr, not me, to going to a deli and ordering a sandwich. And somebody puts a little, she, as she says it, a cat, shit, a cat shit sandwich. Somebody, she says, I don't care if you only put a little in there, even if there's only a little, that's a cat shit sandwich. And so her, and I always thought of that in my head, like, Tina, you can't do that. You can't put even a little bit in there. So anything I wasn't sure about, it either didn't go in there or it says in the book, I'm not sure about this. Well, the book focuses so much on, on your father, Lloyd. And um, although you probably spent more time living with your mother than you did with him. Um, yeah. So... So why do you focus so much on Lloyd besides the fact that he's dead and you can't hurt him? But I mean, really, I mean, why is he so much the focus of your book here? When I first started publishing nonfiction, I could tell it was making my mom anxious. Um, you know, one of my kind of mentors and, and a friend is the poet Kim Stafford. And once I took my mom to a reading that Kim was giving, of his book, 100 Tricks Every Boy Can Do, which is the memoir of his brother who mm -hmm. he lost to suicide. And um, at the end, Kim was taking questions and my mom raised her hand, which she's, she normally wouldn't, like she's normally pretty quiet. So I was very interested when she raised her hand and she said, how does your mother feel about you publishing stories about your family? <laughs> and that was when I realized like, she's really worried about this. So I, I kind of talked to her about it and I thought, you know, the, the, so the original draft of the book had a lot more stories about life with my mom, but it was getting a little long. It was, I could see she was a little anxious and until she could experience what this was like being, you know, any, even if only a little bit, being a, a little bit of a public figure. Um, again, it just wasn't worth it to me to cause anybody any pain. And, um, and the more I stood back and looked at what I had, I realized that I could make a really great book about Lloyd that to me was about answering this question of who is a good person. And it sort of lays that out in the very beginning of the book. It says, you might not think my dad was a good man. And, and once I had decided on this idea of exploring him as a character, as if I were writing a fiction character, which forces me to, to look at his motivations, it was a really interesting practice for me because, um, you know, Again, I think that someone would, a lot of folks would look at someone like Lloyd who, you know, avoided paying child support, who was physically abusive at times, who struggled with sobriety, you know, his whole life and just think he wasn't a good person. And I think that that designation doesn't do us any good. So I, I just was curious, like, could I sort of make it this character exploration 
um, more focused on him. So there's no, now, now that we've done that, my mom loves the book. She's become very comfortable with attending talks like this, even, you know, local talks where everybody knows her. And, um, and so I think she'd be much more comfortable if and when I decide to publish that sort of sister book, which is about the same years living with her in a very different sort of poverty uh, once she left Lloyd. You know, they were together for the first five years and a lot of the book is focused on those first five years and then my time with him in the years that followed. Well, how do you want the reader to see Lloyd? I mean, I think he, as the, it's that tough thing, you know, People often, I, f I feel like I often do talks like this and, and people, a, a really common question I get is like, how do you break the cycle of poverty? Which I sometimes feel like is the wrong question because um, first of all, I can't speak for anybody but myself. But uh, secondly, like there's, that, that puts a negative connotation on poverty itself. And, and so often it feels to me like so much of the shame of poverty came from the outside world telling me I should feel ashamed for my family. And Lloyd had lived with that for generations, that kind of shame. And so I think, um, I think I just wanted the reader to, to look at him and understand that, that, you know, whether I like it or not, and whether it's an easy answer or not, I wouldn't be who I am without Lloyd as my dad. And, um, and he did a lot of really difficult things, but he did a lot of really great things too. There were a lot of gifts that he gave and skills that he taught me that I couldn't have found any other way. Um, so I think, <clears throat> I think I just was hoping that, I don't know, to be honest, it was all an exploration for me, but I think I, I just don't want people to get away too easily with making judgments, particularly about folks that live under the poverty level who struggle with substance use disorder. Well, what, what did Lloyd teach you? What do you feel that you learned from him? Well, first of all, a, a, a respect and love for the natural world, which can carry you so far, you know, in life's struggles, but also um, just constant plotting perseverance. Like he was, Lloyd was constantly failing and then starting over. He would, he would start life in one small rural town in Idaho, things would go bad. He might burn some bridges. He'd show up at a rural town in Washington, start over. Things would go bad. He'd show up in a rural town in Oregon and start over. You know, he was always on the move, but he was always like, you know, he'd show back up at AA and start over. He was always like, all right, I didn't win this time, but I'm going to brush myself off and I'm going to get up and I'm going to try again. And um, I, I don't know, I would have ever gotten through college without that, for example. Like I was not raised with a lot of the skills you need to get through college. It took me a very, very long time um, and a lot of false starts and starting over. And I, and I think that's definitely something I learned from Lloyd. You just keep chipping away at it. Keep putting one foot in front of the other, he used to say. Yeah. Well, we have a question from our audience here and I think it's a great question. So, um, and the question is, because this is so personal, did you ever want to back away from writing this as a memoir? Did you ever consider writing a version as a novel? I didn't. And the reason why, or, or not that I remember anyway, um, I, I, I am considering doing that for some other projects I have in the works, but with this book, I can see ways that, um, that I, I have a lot of privilege compared to a lot of people that I grew up with and just my own sister. Um, my, I have cousins. I have a lot of close family members who, who haven't made it across the poverty line. You know, my mom has seven sisters, just all strong, amazing women. And um, I recognize that, you know, one of the great privileges of receiving an education is there's a way that I was set free from a lot of the shame of poverty and they are not, they're not set free from that. If anyone who's still stuck there just isn't, you know? And so I recognize that I'm in a position to sort of articulate for, for those folks that are still there, you know, the sort of beauty and the joy of it, but also just like, Hey, like we, we are still hum full human beings and we deserve all of the rights therein, you know? And so I felt like 
if I were to publish it as fiction, I would be skirting my duty on that a little bit. I think of it as like, especially if you read the book, my mom and my stepmother, a lot of women in my life, but particularly my mom and my stepmother, you know, put their literal bodies between me and harm many times. And so I feel it's the least I can do to put my myself um, out there for them and sort of, um, you know, tell, tell their story. What's well, interesting that you talk about your mother, because unless I missed it, I don't remember your mother's name ever being in the book. You know, she's either mom or my mother. So yep. why is that? Well, she, she wasn't keen on her name in the book, but also mm -hmm. it's kind of a significant theme in the book that I call Lloyd Lloyd the whole time. And you don't really find out until the center of the book why I call him Lloyd. But mm -hmm. I, it's one of the big... Um, it's a it's it's sort of a big deal because it it illustrates that way that no matter how how much time I spent with my dad or how many ways he tried to prove his love or whatever he was he never belonged to me the way my mother did you know and so she's always mom and he's Lloyd and that's just part of the um you know the disjointed sort of dichotomy of that childhood that's really interesting uh so uh but your mother is a very important figure in, in the book, whether you name her or not. Uh, so what kinds of things did you learn from your mother? Oh my gosh, like everything. <laughs> I feel like she's, you know, it says in the book that she basically made her body into a bridge and we crossed it, you know, and I feel like that's the truth. My brother and I both, you know, are definitely live above the poverty line. And that has everything to do with the choices my mom made for us and the sacrifices. And I think she's, she's just such an example of um, the truth. And you and I were talking about this a little before we went live about how hard it is for, for folks to, to, you know, move out of poverty. Mm -hmm. And it really does for most people, unless you get very, very lucky or something happens, you know, very unusual, you almost have to sacrifice a generation or two. It takes that much in order to get you know, to, to get out of generational poverty. And I, and I think that was, that was what it was like for my mom. And I think it was, she, she's such a smart woman. You know, I always think about like, what would it have been like if she'd been able to go to college instead of constantly working two or three jobs to support her kids. And, um, you know, it's very frustrating to live in a, a world where with so much bounty and, and where everybody around you seems like they're and especially I bet now, I bet it's even harder for single moms now with social media and everybody sort of showing off their goods. But, you know, it's a very frustrating thing to try to raise your children, you know, with joy and hope and love when you, when your options are always so limited. And when you're constantly struggling to just keep a roof over your head, you know, we, we, ha we struggled with housing insecurity a lot you know, had to move houses just based on rent increases or whatever. And, um, you know, it's really hard to provide your children with a sense of security when those are your circumstances. Well, you say your, your mother had all, you know, seven sisters, I think she, you said. Uh, what was different about your mother, do you think, that, that she wanted to make those changes, that she wanted to be a bridge and that she wanted to give you and your brother, Jesse, and your sister, Missy, the kinds of opportunities that she was able to give you? Yeah, I don't know. That's always an interesting question. It's almost like the difference between my sister and I, where I always, and, and I don't think one is better. You know, I always felt that drive, but I, a, a lot of it came from shame, from other people making me feel like my family wasn't good enough. And it is hard because, you know, one thing I've learned about my husband and I talk about it as if, as if it's a migration, you know, moving mm -hmm. your socioeconomic strata. Um, and, and, uh, I do think it's kind of like that. It's almost like coming into a whole new culture, but it's similar to migration in that, um, you leave people behind that there's not really a way to bring them with you. Even if they're, they just live a few blocks away. It's just not the same. You don't run in the same circles. You don't have the same kinds of jobs mm -hmm. anymore. You don't go to the same schools. And so, um, so there's a lot of loss and loneliness for me. Um, and so I, I don't know that, that my mom's way, which was like, she was very, she was very, um, 
very much following the sort of recipe of the capitalist pyramid, like you work your way up and you, and you work to the next level and, you know, all of those things, which is great if it works out for you. But I mean, from where I stand, I can see that I got lucky in a lot of ways that other people don't. And some things worked out for me that, that weren't, had nothing to do with my own merit. You know? <laughs> and so even though I like it when people are like, oh, you were plucky and you figured it out, you know, that, that's only part of the truth. Uh, you know, part of the truth is, is that for some people, it's just not possible. And so my dad, you know, he found a lot of joy in where he was in his position uh, in, in the world. And he found a way to sort of make it very unique in his own. I mean, he would build these, these shacks we would live in that were so magical, even though if you or I drove by one today and saw somebody living in that with children, we might not think of it as magical. But to me as a child, it was like, wow, look at this cool thing my dad made. And we get to live it in it out in the middle of the forest and nobody bothers us. And we, you know, we run around in the woods all day. So, um, you know, he found a lot of joy and magic in his circumstances. Okay. We have a question from our audience. Uh, can you speak to your decision to become a writer and about your daily writing practices? Yeah, so I don't know if any of us ever decide to become writers. <laughs> I think that we're sort of born. I mean, there's a way that I think it, when we were children, if you were to ask any of the grownups around us who would someday write stories about the family, they would probably know it was me. You know, there's always that kid that's sort of quiet and watching and observing and catching everything. And you always, you know, I, I recognize this as an adult now. One of my nieces is just every time you try to talk about something you don't want the kids to hear, you hear that kid's ears perk up, you know, and I'm thinking she's a writer. <laughs> she's already kind of cataloging everything, you know, and, um, and I think part of it is just that that was just who I was. I was always keeping track. I was always kind of standing outside of my situation and writing it as a story in my head. So I think that that's, that's definitely just kind of a natural, uh, natural inclination. I can't even tell you for sure. Um, I also always found, you know, comfort in books and um, companionship in books. So that's probably part of it. Um, as far as writing practice, I, I've always told my students, you know, sit down and write, write every day, try to write four pages a day, you know, and, I, and I've definitely gone through periods where I write four pages a day religiously, no matter what, but I also go through periods where I don't. I think that uh, any writer's life means that you have a daily reading and writing practice. But for me, definitely, I can go two, three weeks of mostly reading and just needing to kind of fill the well back up. Um, but it's definitely something that I tend to every day. Okay. I'm also lucky that I get to teach writing mm -hmm. and I get to teach creative writing and composition and literature. So that that's always kind of keeping me, keeping my hand in it, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, I was struck uh, in reading the book about your use of fairy tales, you know, especially like the, the Little Red Riding Hood and the wolf and the whole idea of Lloyd almost becoming a wolf when he, when he kind of get, goes out of control and then also the Paul Bunyan stories. So can you talk a little bit about, about your use of those fairy tales and how you want them to sort of um, present us, you know, the, what you're trying to get through in your book? Yeah, I, it's interesting because right now I happen to be teaching a mythology and folklore literature class and it's so much fun to look at it and, and consider it that because um, I'm seeing it all in a new light. We're doing a unit on Red Riding Hood next week. So um, yeah, I, uh, I think that part of it was I just needed, first of all, I love nonfiction that infuses anything from the canon. And when I was first writing the book, I had a lot of more smarty pants literary references. And I immediately recognized like, Tina, these don't fit with the book. You didn't know about those great writers back then, right? What stories did you actually know? Because I've always thought of the book, it was really important to me that the book have Lloyd's voice. And I always say that, you know, I think the narrator of the book should be more than 50% Lloyd's daughter, like, you know, to have a little bit more of the sort of dialect and diction of my dad. And, um, and, you know, my dad was probably a 
third to fifth grade reading level. He didn't like to read difficult things. And uh, most of the stories I knew while we were together as a family were oral stories, right? Like Red mm-hmm. Riding Hood and Paul Bunyan. And so I went back and, and, and revised it for that. And, um, and I thought, you know, first of all, it just gives a sense of the, of the sort of magic of, of living in the forest the way we did. You know, we were always moving. We were always living in a different place. So the only thing I could count on is there would always be trees. There would always be water. You know, there would always be forest. And, um, and I think that it, the, the fairy tale element to me was a way to sort of reinforce the kind of adventure of that childhood because, you know, with fairy tales, there's always adventure, which means there's not just fun and childlike wonder, there's risk, there's danger. And I think the Red Riding Hood kind of references go with that really well. Like she wouldn't, there would be no Red Riding Hood if she didn't go into the forest and if she weren't eaten by the wolf, right? That's just her story. And so, um, so it felt like a really good kind of parallel myth, if you will, to my own story where there was, there was never going to be another path for me other than going into the woods with my dad and the way that as I grew older, my growing awareness would eventually conflict with him, right? With, he could only be my daddy for so long. It it didn't take long for me to recognize that his addictions uh, were dangerous and that he, he did cause us harm and cause us pain. And Um, so my growing awareness was eventually going to clash with him. And that, that's just felt like destiny, like a fairy tale, like little red riding hood, you know, and Paul Bunyan was just such a, any kid who grew up with a dad for a logger knew about Paul Bunyan and the way that Paul Bunyan made the idea of folklore feel so possible because everything about him reminded me of my dad, except he was just really big. Right. (laughs) But, um, but he, everything about him, he wasn't some fairy or some, you know, cool monster. He was a lumberjack, which was the most familiar thing in the world to me. Okay. Uh, well, the, in the book, you know, you, you uh, talk a lot about, well, you present a picture of the relationship between poor men and poor women. Uh, and the men don't come off very positively. But can you talk a little bit more about that dynamic and about the role poverty plays in that dynamic? Yeah, I think I would definitely say that um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to keep it specific to my own family. I can't say that that's how it is for all, you know, poor families. And I do want to acknowledge that, you know, now that I've lived in the middle class for, for a good long time, I've definitely noticed, and this is something I touch on a lot in that essay about my sister, Mm -hmm that, that the same problems are here. You know, I've known a lot of men who are abusive to their, their wives and children, a lot of folks who struggle with substance use disorder, a lot of the same problems, but in the middle class, we give each other privacy around those things. And we call it, you know, a rough patch. We don't think of it as a characteristic of the class, the way we do with poor people. Um, I just think that in the case of like my mom or Lloyd, they had far fewer resources to handle those things when they came their way. And so it's always interesting to me to consider what, how different would my life have been if rehab were actually something available to people who don't have money, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, I have a family member who has been toying with rehab for a few years now. And the truth of the matter is, is even if they were able, even if they were ready to go, there's not no place for them to go. They've been trying to find that and the resources just aren't there if you don't have a lot of money to pay for it. And I think a lot of us think, oh, if people would just choose to get well, you know, there's a place for them to go get well. And it's not, it's just not the case. (laughs) Or, you know, a woman in my mom's position who had to literally save change, pocket change for months and months and months and months to be able to have enough gas money to leave her abusive husband because there were no resources to help her do that. And I, and I find this a lot in my job now as a teacher at a community college where I have students who are facing such barriers and there's always this great page on the website that says, here's all these resources for you. And then you, you help a student start reaching out to all these agencies and it's like, oh, wait list. Oh, you know, you have to meet all these parameters before we can help you. And it, it it's, you know, 
if you don't have some family wealth behind you, someone who can help you out, someone who has the stability to, to give you shelter or whatever it is, it's really, really hard to change those circumstances. And so, um, you know, I think that, I don't know if that really answers your question, but I think that it's, um, it's just a tough one because I don't want to, I don't ever want to give the impression that I'm saying those problems only exist between, you know, poor men and poor women. And particularly as a teacher of literature, the one thing you notice over and over again, no matter what book you're reading, no matter what class it's about, there's always going to be those themes of women trying to be independent, but constantly oppressed. And it's very much the way our society is built all the way back to, you know, the, the Greek myths. And, <laughs> and so, um, so it's, it's definitely just sort of something we're all trying to, I hope, reset in this world, but it's definitely um, maybe exacerbated by economic challenges. Um, I think in my own family, definitely there, my father was raised with um, some very distinct roles, you know, and, you know, my grandfather would not put his wife's name on the, on the mortgage, on the title to a car, women, he'd believe women shouldn't own things. And so my dad internalized a lot of those behaviors and it was really, um, my mom leaving him was a game changer because that he was not raised to have a wife leave him. Right. That just wasn't the way it goes. And uh, that was definitely when his life, you know, sort of broke apart and he stopped, he decided to stop, you know, participating in society the way, um, the way he always had, which was at, which was as a, a logger, a timber man. And he started just sort of moving around as if he were still migrating with a logging outfit, but he wasn't really working legitimate jobs anymore. Um, and that was very much because that paradigm had broken for him. Well, what did you learn uh, in writing this book? What did you learn about life in general and about yourself in particular? Oh gosh, that's a hard question. A lot of things. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think I learned to let go of some of the, I had a lot of, um, judgment for my dad, I think, and for a lot of the people in my childhood that I learned to sort of, I learned that I had been pretty foolish in many ways. <laughs> I was very humbling because you have to turn yourself into a character too. And I, and sometimes I am not the best character, you know, um, I think, but I also found some pride that wasn't there before, you know, and it says in the beginning of the book, when it's talking about the, the book opens with a scene of my dad teaching me to ride a bike. And how, you know, I kept falling and he kept making me get back on the bike and I was bleeding and, and how for years, I just thought of it as kind of a savage story as my dad just kept making me do this, even though I was bleeding and it was so awful. But looking at it now, I like making myself sit down and write it and really get into that moment and then come back a couple of days later and come back a couple of days later and keep doing that. I would start to anything like that when I would start to try to write it. I'd have memories come in the middle of the night, you know? And, and so I, I really recognized that I was so happy when I rode the bike, <laughs> like it was such a big deal. And I remember like trying to rub it in my brother's nose, not that he cared because he'd been able to ride a bike for ages, but I was just like strutting my stuff and I was so excited. And so it was, it was a revelation. And I realized the bike riding story was, could almost be the thesis for the whole book, you know, which is that for all these years, I've only remembered the bad things Lloyd had done but what about the good things? Because those have weight too. And they're not canceled out by the bad things. That's not how family works. That not, that's not how parents work. You know, our life experiences, you know, the, the bad ones don't cancel out the good ones necessarily. Um, there, there's some way that they play together. And so I think, I think that realization that I had let myself forget the joy and was just dwelling in the negative. And I think a lot of that comes from that sense from the outside world that I should want for a different kind of life, that I should want to let go of all these things. You know, it's something I think about as a teacher now, you know, in academia, we're really facing up to the fact that, that for generations, we've been imposing, particularly those of us who teach English and literature, we've been imposing on students this um, idea of standard American English, mm -hmm. when there's no such thing as standard American English. There's no document somewhere that standardizes American English. There's not a guidebook that standardizes American English. 
you know, any linguist will tell you that a language is not standardized unless it's dead and written down, but any language that is active is, has numerous dialects that are all equally valid and complex. And so, but when I went to kindergarten and was shamed for saying ain't or for dropping my G's or for my double negatives, which were all uh, speech patterns I'd gotten from my father that I think were reminiscent of his, you know, his family lineage, which goes back to Arkansas and Louisiana. When, when that happened to me, I was told that there was something wrong with my family. There's something wrong with the way I spoke, right? We have this conversation today a lot around AAVE, African-American vernacular English, right? And, and children going to school and being shamed for the way they speak, being asked to change their language. Uh, so school automatically favors children who were raised in, you know, white upper middle class families. Mm -hmm. And so it's just kind of a revelation to me to, to sort of push back on that now as a teacher and say, you know, I say ain't in my classroom and I explain to my students why, you know, I have a lot of students whose, whose English is their second language, Spanish is their first language. And I tell them in, you know, you can write an essay in my class where I can still kind of hear your mom and your grandma in, in the way you write. If I understand your meaning and you're meeting the structural standards I've asked you to put forth in this essay, and you know, you're showing that you've learned the concepts of rhetoric or whatever, you don't have to talk like me. <laughs> and um, I think that's a revolutionary idea, you know? And um, I don't know, I think that that's definitely touches back on the question. Like that's part of, of what I've learned. Okay. Uh, well, you said that your brother Jesse and your mom both have been pretty much involved in the process of, of, of recreating the memoir in the sense that they've read things and, and so forth. How about the rest of your family? What's the, have, have any of them reacted to the book? How, how have they accepted it or not? Yeah, um, the only person I was nervous about was my stepmother, Linda. I hadn't been able to find her for a lot of years and I, and I love her so much and I didn't want to do anything that might cause her harm and she doesn't always come across as you know, a pristine human being in the book, much like Lloyd. Um, you know, they met in AA, they shared a lot of the same struggles, but, in, but were also both, I, I think, you know, important, loving people in my life. And Linda was a, in particular, um, but I couldn't find her before the book was published. So I was worried about her, um, but it turns out Linda had actually passed away. I did finally mm -hmm. hunt down. Yeah, I did finally hunt her down and she had passed away before the book was ever even a thing. So um, I've had a a mostly just really positive response to the book from, from my family, from people who know me. Um, the only, only other person that sort of concerned me was my, my dad's sister is still living and she's just a wonderful person. And my dad was really close with his siblings. Um, and I would have liked her to read it beforehand, but we didn't make that connection. And so she didn't read it until it was published. And, and she just, I think it, you know, it was painful, but also beautiful for her to read. And it's sort of what my brother said. He said, you know, it's, it's like we get to have him, you know, even though he's gone, we still kind of have him. There's a way that we get to keep him in this way, but it, you know, it tells the truth. So it's not, it's not always happy truth and that's hard, but for the most part, it's been great. Like I haven't really had any complaints. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about, uh, sort of literary influences on you. Uh, what authors do you read? Any. <laughs> you know, I sold books for, for a long time. So I right now I tend to mostly buy um, a lot of nonfiction and essay. And I'm and I tend to buy, I'm tend to be really interested in books written by women or other marginalized populations and or people who are writing about about folks who've been marginalized because to me there's just something really joyful about people who are living in the margins and who still find a way to create and so and to make art and to tell stories and and so that tends to be where my focus lies um but I will read anything and I read to as I was writing this book I read a lot of nonfiction, but a lot of fiction too like I was definitely influenced by a lot of fiction I I read so many books and then I and I dwindled down this stack of, of 12 or 14 books that I was like okay there's something in each one of these that I want to to try to use like you know Toni Morrison's Sula 
to me, that book, nobody teaches you how to almost turn your, your, your natural environment into like a character the way Toni Morrison can. And, and in that book, you know, the, the whole, everybody lives in this community called the bottom and it, it almost has a personality. It's almost alive. It's a character in the book. And mm -hmm. so that was a really big influence for me because the natural world played such a huge part in my upbringing. And, um, and so just being able to really build out the character of the places I lived in Oregon, Washington, Idaho, but particularly Oregon and Washington. Um, but yeah, I, right now I'm reading this really great essay collection called Leaving Isn't the Hardest Thing, Leaving Isn't by Lauren Howe, which is, she was raised in the um, Children of God cult, mm. a really good book about coming out of that cult and, and having to live in normal society, but also coming out like she was coming to terms with her sexuality. And so just a really beautiful essay collection. She's in the military. So there's you know, figuring out, figuring that out during the don't ask, don't tell era. It's just a really great book. Um, if you haven't read it yet, I highly recommend. Um, so yeah, I'm always, I'm always reading. Okay. Well, what advice do you have for people who want to write a memoir? <laughs> um, read a lot of memoir, read a lot of books. Um, I so often have students who who are so excited they want to be writers, but they they forget that they need to also be readers. And um, you know, I always tell tell them you need to be listening as much as you talk. And and so, how many voices have you listened to? You know, before you try to take the stage. And and I think this is something that came to me from years of book selling. Like I came to recognize publishing as an ecosystem. And if you don't feed into the ecosystem, you shouldn't expect to take anything out of it. And I, and I remember I used to tell self-published authors this all the time because they would come into this small independent bookstore I was running and um, want me to take time out of my day when they hadn't scheduled an appointment and pay attention and listen to them pitch their book and then purchase their book and give it space on my shelf. And I, and I want to do that. I want to support writers, but I remember kind of sitting down with them and saying, hey, have you ever bought a book here? Oh, no, I have a lot of books from you know who. And I'm like, well, but is you know who going to sell your book? You know, and, and, and so it's like, it's an ecosystem. You have to pay into it. And so I always tell my students that, like, are you, are you giving to the ecosystem as much as you're asking it to take from you? You know, do you go to your library events? Do you support, support your local public library? Do you support your local independent bookstore? How do you... Um, how do you give to the literary community so that it can be healthy enough to give back to you? And I think it's a big piece missing for a lot of people who wanna be writers. Um, and especially in this era of self-publishing, it's like, but I can just write it and stick it online and, and that's great. But I think if, 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 you're, if you're asking me what I would say to somebody who's hoping to publish a memoir, that's definitely what I would say. Like, how are you contributing to the ecosystem? What relationships are you creating? you know, because if we don't keep it healthy, it won't be here for us. Um, but in terms of the emotional turmoil of writing a memoir, I always tell people, uh, and I think this is a Mary Carr idea, I think I probably stole this from Mary Carr, is, you know, you got to write that hardest part first. Because a lot of people think I have a memoir to write because something really shocking or terrible happened to me. And then they sit down to do it. And it's, it's insurmountable. And, you know, Mary Carr says, if you, if you can't, write that without being having a real emotional response you might not be ready to do things like what we're doing right now sit here and talk about the book with people right so you might write it for a cathartic exercise which i think everyone should write the story of their life and process for that reason but you might not be ready to actually share it with the world unless you can write that hardest part and um and be able to stand back and and not you know not have too much of an emotional response what was the hardest part for you in writing so fast? In the writing or? Yeah. Well, when you talk about writing the hardest part for you, what was the hardest part? Well, well definitely the, the center chapter, which is called The Worst Thing. Right. And it was a story I had never told anybody out loud. And it was, um, to me, it was, it was so important to write it the way I wrote it. It's the first place in the book where I just sort of break that rule of, of having mostly Lloyd's voice and it's really in my own voice. As a matter of fact, if you 
think about it, the, the literary references in that part are the, the Minotaur and the Labyrinth. So it's definitely something I wouldn't have known in my childhood, you know, so it definitely kind of betrays. I always think of myself as two characters in the memoir. There's the, there's the child who's living through things and growing and she doesn't know her future. She doesn't know what's going to happen. And then there's the narrator sitting at the desk writing who knows how everything works out in the end. And that chapter at the beginning, the worst thing, that's fully that narrator's voice, not the child's. And um, she knows what's gonna happen. She's standing outside of it and looking. And to me, it was really, really important, but also really, really hard to write that piece because I wanted to really try to illustrate on the page how a person processes that kind of trauma and um, what that process is like. And, um, and that's definitely been something I receive a lot of letters and emails about is that, mm -hmm. that chapter and just the, that it's so different. The whole rest of the book, I tried to write it somewhat like a novel, like things are happening, there's scene, there's setting, there's character. We're making sure there's a little bit of, you know, dramatic kind of arc so that it carries the reader. Mm -hmm. But that center is just about this woman processing this trauma, because I I wanted to hold that space for every person who approaches the book and has a similar trauma to process to just like, we're going to sit here and we're going to go through this together. And, um, and it has made me so known to other people. It's a, it's like a miracle how people will write to me. And it's as if we've met in a space outside of, of time and place, you know, but two humans have made this, this connection in this sort of magical space. But it was definitely the hardest. It probably had the most revision. It's the most intricate sort of chapter in the whole book. Well, it's a real shock as you're reading and all of a sudden you turn the page and there's just what, two or three lines. And it's huh. like, oh my goodness. You know, so it's a real signal. I mean, I don't want to spoil it for other people what, what, right. the, you know, what the episode is, but, but uh, it really is an incredibly shocking and important thing to talk about and i and i have a sense that there are very few women out there who are not going to be able to understand what you're talking about yeah and relate for sure and I, and that's why i held that empty space you know in publishing they don't like us to leave empty space like that but i was like we're holding this space because I think up to this point, any reader is sort of like, well, Lloyd does some pretty bad things, but he's still pretty likable. And then it's like, whoa, oh. I did not think Lloyd would do that. And um, and so it was just important to me that that child victim gets to hold that space and the reader has to sit in that discomfort just a little bit as any of us, like you said, any woman who's been there knows, <laughs> you know, and then we can process it together. But um, you know, it, it needs its adequate space that we have to start giving these things that space or else these patterns just continue. Right. Yeah, you know, it was really very, very effective. Thank you. So, so do you have, what, what projects do you have in the pipeline now? <laughs> what can we look forward to? <laughs> a couple of things. I need to, I need a month at the beach to work on them. Um, but I do have an essay collection I'm working on. And then I'm also, I've got kind of the sister book drafted to this book which is kind of the same years only the poverty from inside my mom's house and what it was like to have you know a single mom who uh was working all the time and was trying you know the ways that men would sort of take advantage of women in that situation landlords you know bosses who who know you are dependent on them for shelter or income and uh the the tough decisions she would have to make you know, it wasn't, she couldn't decide on most days how to keep us safe. In most days, it was more like, what is the best of two evils, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and right. so um, there's a lot of important lessons in that. And then also, you know, I, I tend to write a lot about my sister and you mentioned that essay earlier. Um, but those are things, that's probably a project I would consider turning into fiction because, you know, her life is, is a very real full human life. And, um, and it's important to me to help to not do anything that might cause her grief or, or trouble, um, you know, by, by publishing it. Um, and then I, uh, I have an essay coming out. I sh it would be smart of me to, to, to have that information with me um, in a magazine in the next couple of weeks, I think, which is an essay about um, my mentorship with the poet Banu Kapil, who's an amazing 
uh, poet in the UK. She actually just won, just last year, won the T.S. Eliot Prize, which I'm very proud. Mm -hmm. um, it's basically like the, the top poetry prize in the UK. And she was my mentor in graduate school. And I wrote an essay about um, our work together and about how, how much she taught me about being a teacher, how so often as a child, um, teachers who were well-meaning would would definitely do things that made me feel uh, outside, you know, or, or other, even though they didn't meet, that was the complete opposite of their intention. And um, so cause it's sort of an essay about my work with Banu, teachers I had as a child, and then my own work as a teacher and how much I'm constantly trying to think about this, like how my words might be impacting my students and um, how I can, instead of be a gatekeeper, be throwing the gates as wide open as I possibly can, so. That's great. So, but you don't have any like firm deadlines or anything for- No, like, not right now. No. Nope. Okay. <laughs> okay. It's coming. It's coming. It'll all be on the website. Okay. Well, Tina, I really want to thank you so much. This has been a real joy to me to talk with you about this book. And, and I highly recommend this book. Uh, oh, wait a minute. We have a question. Just a minute. I want to make sure that everybody's questions get answered. Um, oh. I have been reminded that I am supposed to plug our January 24th deadline for Writers Read. Uh, so, and, and I'm sure you will appreciate this as a, as a teacher of writing. Uh, uh, Kennebich Library, we have an annual Writers Read event where we are soliciting um, entries uh, uh, from folks. People can, uh, can send us uh, Poems, essays, short stories, 600 word uh, is, is the uh, no more than 600 words, no more than three entries per person. And the deadline is January 24th. And actually, now that you've heard this, maybe you would like to participate. Uh, you know, it's it's you know, it's for folks any, from anywhere. And our the topic is recovery question mark. And after our discussion today, it looks like a, a topic that you probably would be able to write quite a bit about. So but yeah, again, I was writing it down as you spoke because I was going to ask you, would it be something that people, because I also thought I have students who have some oh, yes. beautiful work on recovery. Yeah. Um, January 24th. Start. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so I'm certainly glad that I got, that I got reminded of this. Um, I used to be able to remember all these things without reminders, but that's the way life is. Anyway, again, I really want to thank you, Tina. This has been a real pleasure. And I really look forward to whatever you're going to be writing next. Thank you. I appreciate it. And thank you, Jen, for the, for the support. I really appreciate being invited and, be, and getting to come to Cannon Beach for a night, even if there was a tsunami. Exactly. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.